we will start this panel, which I think fits very well. It's a nice bridge to what uh, Ms. Calvino was speaking about also in terms of what has been done, what may need to be done, what further steps may be needed on the um, on the Captain Marks Union and what we're going to focus a little bit on in the next um, 90 minutes or so, I should clearly stay away from that one, in the next 90 minutes or so is the uh, consolidation of the EU uh, trading landscape and stock market action issue, which has been a little bit alluded to uh, during this morning already. I'm not going to, to speak about that myself, but I'm joined here um, by a very distinguished um, group of speakers that I'm going to introduce very briefly. I will not read the CVs, that would take far too long, but just to mention very briefly to you who you have here uh, on the panel together with me. I have Athanasios Koloredas from the Greek Union of um, a chairman of the management committee of the Greek Union of Listed Companies, to be very precise. Uh, next to my right, I have uh, Peter Koblitz, CEO of Prague Stock Exchange and also the president of the Federation of uh, European Securities Exchanges, so FISA. We have Javier Hernani, CEO of the, uh, my Spanish is not what it should be, Bolsas y Mercados Español, so BME. Um, we then have uh, Gunshan from the, she's the global head of Captain Markets and Market Intelligence, State Street Global Advisors. And last but absolutely not least, uh, Yuan Almegain, Swedish State Secretary for Financial Markets. So you really have, I think, the top of the top to to speak here uh, to, this, to this topic. And I also think, uh, or I know actually we're going to have slightly uh, different points of view here, which I think will probably ensure that we get a very interesting panel. The way uh, I intend to run this is to have first uh, the speakers will get the opportunity to give some very short introductory remarks showing their perspectives and then we're going to run this in terms of two rounds of questions and given that we have 90 minutes which is quite generous we will also have the uh, opportunity to take some questions here from the room but also uh, from colleagues that are joining uh, online and i know that we are what's standing between you and your lunch so we will also try to uh, finish in time if we if we can so without further ado, uh, we will start the um, first round and as a little bit of a say, opening question here to the panelists, what are your views on the current landscape for trading and post-trading, by the way? And we're speaking about the EU, of course, although I'm sure that the US will be mentioned as well. Would further consolidation be beneficial? Um, are the main challenges we see actually uh, due to this fragmentation? And I think the fragmentation has been mentioned a lot this morning by all speakers. Or do we have broader issues that we actually probably need to target uh, rather than focusing too much on the consolidation? So this is, again, a short round, three, four minutes each. And I will start with you, Yvonne. Thank you. Thank you, Paulina. It's a real pleasure to be here. So, um, first of all, let me say that I'm trying to think about whether the glass is half empty or half full when thinking about the current landscape. So, if you think about trading, clearing, settlement, essentially these are very tech-intensive operations, so it's easy to see that there are returns to scale, you would have a business case for consolidation, and yet when we look around Europe, we see that a lot of these operations still have a sort of national character. So something seems to be amiss, and from that perspective, perhaps the glass is half empty. On the other hand, um, I think you could also argue that the glass is half full, and here I think, uh, to start with, it's good to remember where we're coming from. So there was a lot more fragmentation in this space if you go back a few decades. In particular, we had features such as a lot of regional stock exchanges even. There was a wave of consolidation, at least in the 90s. I think this country is one example, Italy is another, Spain is one. Um, so, so there has been a lot of consolidation. What we also see uh, in more recent years is consolidation in the form of having one firm with many faces in a sense. So horizontal and vertical integration, where really a handful of firms are actually active in a lot of these areas across Europe. Um, so I think you could argue that there is quite a lot going on here. Nonetheless, there do seem to be some thresholds in a sense, maybe it's something that's preventing this from moving further. So, so that's easiest, I think, to see in the, in the CSD space, where the comparison with the US seems, seems quite relevant. 
So I think, um, is this a problem or not? It's good to think about why would this be a problem? Is there a market failure? Not so easy to see. Are there unintended consequences of other regulations? Here I think it's been mentioned uh, by se several people already this morning, um, the legal frameworks, the fact that national jurisdictions in other areas, not least company law, insolvency law, tax rules, seem to be reinforcing some of these national boundaries. And that might have unintended consequences that could actually be a problem in this space. Then the question is a problem for whom? So is it a problem for firms? Probably a little bit. Um, in Sweden, we have rich listing activity, so, so that's not so much an issue for, for us, but I know it looks very different across Europe. I will say, though, not to forget that there are other ways for firms to also find capital. So let's not forget that USITS has been a tremendous success story. It's, if if LTIF could achieve even you know a fraction of that success, that would be a very important step in the right direction. We've also seen tremendous growth in the private equity domain in the last couple of decades, and that's, that's very important for the more unlisted uh, firms. So there are other channels. Perhaps it's not quite as big a problem for the firms as it's sometimes made to be. I think it is a problem for the perception of the single market, for sure. Um, and there it's very welcome to have this discussion in the reports by Letta and the 1G and so on. Finally, I would say, is it a problem for savers? Uh, and here the experience across Europe is very different. Um, in Sweden, households have considerable exposure to stock markets, and it's in particular thanks to things that are, frankly, national levers that you can pull. So maybe a lot of low-hanging fruit has already been picked for financial integration. In terms of the sort of mobilizing capital, encouraging people to invest in stocks, there is, I think, still low-hanging fruit across Europe. In Sweden, it's really had a lot to do with how you design your pension system, both the public and occupational schemes, and how you design your tax code. Happy to share more about that later today. Thank you very much. You want a lot of uh, food for uh food for thought, low-hanging fruit and food for thought. I think the, I mean, clearly the Swedish experience is of course very interesting here. And as you alluded to, uh, national pension systems, the tax systems, tax incentives do play a role here if we look at the, the bigger picture and we will have the opportunity to come back to uh, some of these issues later in the discussion. But I will turn to Javier now. Thank you. Thank you, Paulina. Thank you very much for having me today. I, I have the impression that I'm going to be the rebel here in terms of what we are um, discussing. I think fragmentation is a big word uh, and it's very political and it's very easy to use and it's more difficult to define. What is fragmentation in trading? What is fragmentation in post-trading? And why are we here today discussing these things? First of all, I think we are discussing because we, at least this is my opinion, no? we, we are really worried and concerned that there is no capital flowing efficiently into the European markets. Is this a question of how fragmented that the trading venues has been in Europe? It's not. Uh, what is really the fragmentation playing a role in this, in this subject? Do you really believe that if we had one single platform, we would have better capital inflows in the, in the European market? I don't. First of all, if we talk about fragmentation, we're talking about, we're always talking about exchanges. It's always like, uh, as you mentioned, Johan, the regional exchanges. Now, uh, we have in this moment, and I, I come to this morning with my, my iPhone and my glasses, so it's probably not right. We have 190 systematic internalizers. 190, 90. 280 trading venues. How many exchanges out of that? So the regulation, the European regulation has pushed for fragmentation because it pushed for competition. And now we are here in a situation in which 30 or 40% of the total liquidity of the market is not lit, is opaque, is in the hands of systematic internalizers. And this is killing, killing the trading between auctions. And this is what is happening. So are we worried about liquidity in the markets? Then we should be worried really about the systematic internalizers effect into the liquidity that is available for companies. When I talk to issuers, and I do it all the time, what some banks tell them to go to the U.S. is because they show that the trading platforms have a better liquidity. We are showing worse liquidity from five to ten years ago. So is this, the fragmentation is what? That's, that's my first question. Second, in post-trade, 
Okay, in post-trade, we, we talk about post-trade as a single thing. Post-trade is a very interesting, I tell you, it's a plumbers, huh? I know. I also had the um, security services uh, had the unit in Six Group. It's very complex, but it's very interesting. Is there fragmentation in clearing? We compare ourselves to, to the US. Uh, here we have Rafa, Rafa Plata from each. Uh, well, I mean, in, in, in cash clearing, there, there are clear tools like the preferred CCP uh, uh, rules, like the interoperability rules, which is clearly, in my opinion, devising already a common a space for clearing. It will take time, it will take time, but it, the, some of the rules are already there. In CSDs, my God, we're talking about 32 CSDs, who, who has completely forgotten that we have a T2S. We have 20 CSDs connected to a single settlement engine, which is the ECB, we're here. So we have one single settlement point for all Euro securities in the hands of the ECB. So we're talking about fragmentation here? I don't believe it. What do CSD do? CSDs do three things. One is settlement, used to do, and now it's ECB. The other one is notary, notary functions. So are we saying that we want one notary in Europe? I want to be that guy. Eh? So we're giving all notary functions to one single CSD? Is that what we want? No competition in CSDs? Uh, that's what I believe. I mean, notary functions are very important and obviously very also related to the granular ecosystem of where the companies are, so on and so forth. And I'm sure Peter will say something like this. And the fourth thing is custody. So we do settlement, we do notary, editions, and we do custody. Are we saying we want to give all custody to one single CSD? Is that what we want? Then we should also ask for a custodian banks merger, no? Should, why should we have one single CSD for custody and we have a number of custodian banks in, in Europe? So what do we want? We want competition, we want uh, efficiency, uh, if we talk about efficiency and why and how can we compete with the U.S. for liquidity, for better markets, for better capital allocation, let's have it. And I'll, I'll have my, my, my moderate contribution later. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the word that kind of strikes me as policymaker, what we like a lot in the European Commission is, of course, kind of finding that balance between, I guess, the, you know, ensuring the efficiency and the competitiveness. Uh, I guess we should not maybe f focus too much on the number of actors, but more look a little bit deep, deeper on how, how things are actually working. But um, anyway, we will have, have the opportunity to get back to all these issues. Um, the, Peter, over to you. Okay. So thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. I would probably a uh, little bit follow on on what uh, Javier was saying. You know, I was uh, I was supposed to actually talk to the last one that there are not two exchanges talking after each other. Then it looks that we are really forming a block here. But um, yeah, there is kind of elephant in the room. You know, we are we are a lot talking about the improvement of the markets and. Uh, uh, everybody knows, everybody knows who's watching the capital markets, how far we are lagging behind the United States. Um, some of us say, you know, we don't want to be compared. We are also good. You know, we in Europe, uh, you know, have other features, you know, not only the, this rough thing, you know, U.S. capital markets. We have a more social view and other things. Uh, yes, well, don't be mistaken. I'm a proud European, but... Um, when it comes to the capital markets, it's about the shares, it's about investment banks, and it's about the investors. And these guys can read hard numbers. They want to make money, and they want to spend as little as possible. And they are pointing at the United States as more liquid market, more efficient market, more deeper market, and sometimes even better valued market. So we have to look a lot in the United States, what they are doing and how they are doing the things. Um, and I'm not saying that we should immediately merge all the CSDs into one DDCC, you know, that obviously are those problems which, which Rafael was mentioning, and uh, I would, uh, I completely assign it. Um, there are so many issues around. We heard a lot of them already in the morning, um, especially from Commissioner McGuinness. Uh, I, I probably don't want to repeat all of them, so this yeah, unified solvency law, securities law, maybe 28th regime, I would probably pick one thing, and those are the resulting tax or, or on, on dividends and coupons. We have just been discussing before in a small circle here how big a nightmare is for a um, citizen of, of Spain, I was discussing with Rafael, to invest in uh, French equities. Do you think it's a nightmare for a citizen of Mississippi to invest in the New York equities? It's not. 
You know? So uh, do you think there's a problem for a citizen in Washington state to invest through the bank, which is based in New York, on the exchange, which is based in New York, to the Florida startup? No, it's not. It's very easy. In Europe, you don't even know about those deals. We, me as a Czech, I would not even get access to the list of the deals which are on BME right now being subscribed in IPO. And even if I would find it somewhere, which is on the on the pages of my of my colleagues, there would be no way I can invest in. No way. Due to the regulation, due to the lack of interoperability of the investment banks. Actually, I will speak about it later if I get an opportunity how the investment banks are, you know, kind of covering the uh, covering the region. We definitely have to unlock the this kind of savings and especially pension savings. It's, it's great that we have Johan here because uh, I think the example of uh, uh, ESK, I believe it's the name, the long-term uh, pension product is just a screaming success, and we have it right under our noses in Sweden just translate it from the Swedish and copy that to the national regulations and maybe make some kind of pan-European one because it's a screaming success and they prove it. So these kind of things are also longing through from my point of view. And um, last but not least, I will say last sentence, there is uh, one topic which uh, me as a representative from the, let's say, new countries, well, what is new is like already 30 years of the European Union, um, see very importantly and uh, you know for the for the people sitting in brussels paris frankfurt uh, they don't even know that there is such a kind of problem it's a problem of the indexes europe is split by the index providers into the map of 1989 it is like this and unless those index providers will not dramatically change the rules it will be forever these borders will be there forever. There is no way Slovenia would make it under recent condition of the index providers into developed market, even if they have a GDP of Switzerland. The rules were written in the 80s and they are still the same. So we, as a European Union, I always urge everybody speak, look at this problem, try to understand this problem and speak to the index providers because that's another split which is under the radar and it's extremely important. Thank you very much, Peter. I feel we're getting a longer and longer to-do list here. Um, very useful. By the way, on withholding tax, there was actually a recent agreement on an EU proposal, which I think is an important step forward. But of course, that still needs to be uh, implemented nationally. So we've heard from, in a public perspective, from from, you, from Johan, we have heard the stock exchanges. And now I turn to, to Gunjan from the State Street perspective, the private sector. Thank you. Thank you, Paulina. I appreciate it. So I'm going to have fun sitting next to Javier, given the comments that he made. So, you know, back to your question, what do we want from an investor perspective? I think we absolutely want to ensure that the investor experience trading on exchange is as positive as it can be. I think we absolutely want there to be as much transparency as there can be. So the three areas from my vantage point that I think are crucial as we consider the question of consolidation of exchanges across the landscape in Europe are threefold. First of all, let's look at the numbers. The lack of growth or the stagnation in average daily trading volumes on the European addressable market is hard to ignore. Over 23 and year to date 24, the numbers are still stuck at 48 billion and have not grown globally average daily trading volumes have been growing at 17%. The growth is coming from the US, over 100 billion year over year from 23 to 24. So back to your question when issuers are looking at where should we look to list, investors are looking at where should we trade, those deep, liquid, transparent markets in the US are really hard to ignore and become a, quite an attractive proposition for investors. And I think we have to look at something here in Europe to address that. The second area that I'd flag, and again, Javier touched on the point, Peter also in his remarks, 33% of on-exchange trading volumes are what occur across Europe today. 43% is happening off exchange and 11% is in dark pools that are definitely not transparent to any retail investors who want to understand wherever they're trading, what are they getting into? 
what is the information? How can they access it so that they can make informed decisions? Retail investors are not able to make as informed decisions when the data is not readily available across the European markets. The consolidated tape in the US has added to price transparency. It's added to the data for all investors, institutional or retail, that have access to those insights for price discovery, being able to make informed decisions about where to trade. And I think that's also something that consolidation across exchanges in Europe could really help bring about. And I'm eagerly anticipating the um, full implementation of the consolidated tape when we get to that towards the end of 25 and 26, which I know the ESMA technical team are working through. The third and final item, we can't ignore RFQs. RFQs continue to grow in what they see for volume of trading. That is taking away, without a doubt, the exchange volumes that could be seen as a result. If you compare, again, in Europe what we see, and I'll give you some statistics from an ETF perspective, the US market for every primary market dollar traded sees $9 equivalent in the secondary market. Really deep, really mature, very transparent to all investors. In Europe, only $3 trade as an equivalent to every dollar traded in the secondary market. If there isn't as deep a secondary market trading, again, that will form for a large part how investors are making their decisions. As an ETF issuer, I will bring a product to Europe and I will then list that on average across five or six different exchanges across Europe. Immediately, the liquidity is fragmented. So, you know, from my vantage point, having to explain to an investor where they should then trade, how they should think about trading and where those decisions are made, it's very easy to lose them through that conversation when there is so much choice and so many more decisions to make than there might be perhaps compared to the US marketplace. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I mean, consolidated tape, indeed, of course, also something where we have a, a recent agreement and probably what, what some would refer to as the famous incremental step towards the, uh, the CMU, but clearly something that I, I also, like you, think will be very, very useful once fully implemented. To finish off the, the, law, the first round, uh, last but absolutely not least, uh, Athanasias. Yes, thank you very much, the organizer, for the invitation. It's uh, very, I'm very honored. Well, integration of financial markets is indeed an elusive goal. Efforts have been made for the past 35 to 40 years. And for uh, some, it is a chimera, an unrealistic goal. For others, it's a panacea, a treatment for every European uh, capital market seal, meaning cross-border barriers. Uh, illiquidity, etc. So why Greek people always use Greek words, strange Greek words to say simple things, it's meant to be an internal uh, mental flaw. Um, well, the path to such goal, uh, the consolidation of markets is not a straight, straight line. And indeed, um, uh, the strategy that already, it is important to understand the strategy that we are using. and. Uh, the strategy we're using has two major components. The first is indeed uh, um, harmonization, regulatory harmonization. And the second is competition. I will uh, disagree with Xavier that fragmentation, uh, that competition leads to fragmentation. This is the means. The end of the goal of the competition is indeed concentration, and I say why. What do we mean with competition? Competition against uh, natural and legal monopolies uh, until now, CSDs and uh, stock exchanges used to be, a couple of years ago, legal or natural monopolies in uh, various national uh, uh, laws and uh, uh, countries. Uh, but MTFs, cross-border uh, access, um, freedom to provide service of CSD, they are all rules that they try to fight against increased competition. And competition indeed leads to fragmentation, but speaking also as an academic, the strategy is based on something that is, co is called liquidity bias. Liquidity attracts liquidity. So the idea is a fight between competitors and the, uh, the more liquid shall prevail. This is what happened in the US, apparently. Uh, so uh, does it work? Not, not necessarily. 
why, we need to find how. But, but, but this strategy has some internal flaws. The first flaw is that it relies mainly on big investment banks. And we need to ask what will be the role of smaller investment firms and other providers. The second is that it may lead to the so-called cream skimming. If liquidity provide, if new alternative venues use local exchanges only for netting their positions and they take the trade themselves, if uh, uh, new venues or the competition between stock exchanges attract best the best companies of a local stock exchange and the local exchanges remain with the second level companies, I mean at the local level, then local exchanges likely will perish. This is what happened in the US. It's not uh, something new. So we need to find a way that we promote financial integration, but we also give a role to all these players. How we can do that? I think this is the one billion question. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will try to find some, some answers here on the panel. Um, and let's go on to the to the second round. I think we've already um, covered a lot of ground, actually. I uh, would, in the second round, invite, of course, also panelists to uh, agree and disagree with what others have um, have said. Uh, what we will focus on in the second round, and it's already been covered by several of you, is a little bit the drivers of fragmentation, what are the barriers? Uh, let's maybe not focus too much on fragmentation consolidation, but more what do we want to achieve? We want to achieve high levels of transparency, we want to achieve high levels of liquidity, we want to have efficient markets in the in the EU. The international comparison, we will, you know, you Yuan will explain a bit more about the Swedish uh, experience, but the US, of course, comes back a lot in these comparisons as well. Obviously, the US is a bit different, and I'm sure we will have the possibility to touch on that also in this round. So, for this round, I will start with uh, with Javier. Um, was following up from what you you said earlier. Maybe you want to share something about your own experience with the merger of BME and the Sixth, but also these kind of EU US comparison, which I which I know that you wanted to speak a little bit to. So please. Thank you. Well, the experience of uh, of um, consolidating BME and six and BME, I think, is very positive. Also, because of the, um, the touching on on the topics that we are dealing with, with today, you know, in terms of how to to make a better market, how to integrate post trade to, to the uh, to the maximum, so we can actually make securities flow uh, in a, in a better way. No, um, and clearly the experience is that this can be done. The, for example, in post trade, we've uh, we've done a couple of things that I think are very interesting, and I, again, I think they are neglected by uh, people when they when we look at the post trade and we look at the number of CSDs, we tend to forget that. Uh, we have bilateral accounts between the, the CSDs of the euro, which means actually that uh, there is a pool of holding of securities within the eurozone that is that is actually uh, enabled by target to securities. The target to securities is not, is not only about settlement; it's about also the bilateral accounts of the different CSDs with each other, which actually creates a pretty firm and uh, homogeneous. Uh, set of, of network of, of post trade that I think is extremely unique in this moment. We're trying to put that also in context with the with the uh, CSDs that we, we run in the uh, in the six group by by having three links. There's a link between uh, Iberclear and SIS. So we have a bilateral account that enables settlement and custody to to be seamless between the two constituencies. And this one is out of out of the European Union. The other one is inside. And another one that is a digital CSD. So we have a SDX, which is a digital CSD, fully licensed in Switzerland. So we can actually transfer digital to legacy and then legacy to digital in a, in a pretty seamless way. We are starting, but this is clearly a, an element of interconnection and interconnectivity, which is what I think what issuers want and what uh, investors want, which is that we make it happen in a more seamless way. So that, in my opinion, works. Uh, and again, don't. Uh, uh, don't neglect the importance of target to securities. Target to securities, sorry to say this, has been a pain to make it work. Sorry. It really took us a long time to the ECB and ourselves to make it work uh, uh, properly. So it now works, works very well. 
And now is the second stage of targeted securities, which is basically how do we make the most of this common settlement platform and common bilateral links network. I think it's extremely important. This is the second phase of T2S is starting now, in my opinion. That's extremely important not to be neglected when we talk about fragmentation of, of, uh, of post-trade with the US. I, I think we, we don't disagree so much. I, I, uh, everything you say in the first part of uh, opaque trading and everything else, is, we are exact, absolutely on the same page. I think this is the disaster of regulation in, in Europe is precisely this one. So we really need to, to take this into lead markets. Uh, and honestly, this, this is not a low-hanging fruit. It's something we need to do. Either we stop this, either we stop systematic internalizers from taking away liquidity for the market, or we kill the market. That's what it is. It's going to happen in five or ten years, whatever it is, but unless we take decisive action now, uh, I mean, it's, it's worthless that we talk about consolidation or anything else, because honestly, we are here consolidating. The, I mean, we, can, we have to consolidate to minus 190, not to get it consolidated. So it's a kind of a mathematical uh, paradox. No? We cannot consolidate to the level that we actually re, uh, stop that fragmentation. There is no way. So uh, we've done a lot of efforts, but the more the, the year after year, there's more there's more fragmentation there. And that I think is the the biggest uh, difference with the US. The US is a super liquid market. Uh, is is absolutely true. We are also losing the narrative, and I stop here because I think I will take too much time. We are also losing the narrative. Eh? We are allowing uh, that arguments like liquidity actually influence arguments on valuation. That, sorry, I don't buy. I was a young analyst many years ago, uh, and I, I, you know, I've had the opportunity to do value many companies. Honestly, if somebody would have come to me with a file without the name and telling me how much is this company, I would have come to 100 uh, of valuation, and then, then they tell me there is one missing data, a piece of data, is listed in the US. I would have said, oh, yeah, sorry, 130. Yeah. Sorry, I mean, this is, to me, is not analytically uh, correct. But I see more and more pieces of information com coming on this, on this trend of saying the reality. The reality is that valuation is not better in the U.S. for because this is, uh, is a bigger market. This is not true. Uh, I honestly think that there is no data that is actually strong behind these kind of things. And we are losing the narrative again. We are losing, and I, I really welcome this kind of debates. By the way, we tried in Spain with a white book presenting 56 measures in the Spanish market to try to enhance the Spanish market and the listings and everything else. And we will talk about it in a minute. Uh, we really need to, to reinvigorate the US market because otherwise we lose the narrative and our issues will go there unless we, we tell them the truth, first of all. It's true that it's a liquid market, but not because you go to the US, you get a better valuation. I mean, analysts are not stupid, are they? I wasn't. I wasn't very good, eh? but but honestly, I mean, to say that because it's a US it's a US listed company, the valuation is is higher. I think honestly, think we have, really have to fight back against these things because it's getting into the heads and the brains of our issuers and entrepreneurs, and this is honestly something that we should uh, we should be uh, be very very mindful of. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think maybe in general sometimes that we have a bit of a narrative uh, challenge in europe and that we sometimes talk ourselves down a, a little bit it's a bigger debate but i think it what you said is, is interesting javier um you spoke a little bit directly to uh Gunjan, so i will go back to to you also you already shared a little bit uh, your perspective on the comparison between the eu and the us but maybe you want to also react a little bit to to what javier said yeah, look, I think um, I think there are absolutely elements that we need to learn lessons from, but we also shouldn't be caught out by the red herring statements, which I, I think is what you were addressing. Bigger doesn't always mean better. Um, and let's just talk about liquidity. So when I'm thinking of what's the impact of a fragmented market, I'm thinking about what does that mean for the end investor in accessing liquidity? So first of all, the market makers, those who trade across the secondary market, Liquidity is still available, even in a fragmented market. But if you double click, what's the cost of that fragmented liquidity? And that's where I come back to the investor experience. So our data shows us when you are across the European market, having to nav navigate so much fragmentation, coupled with the fact that the majority of the volume trades off exchange, it's not even on exchange, the execution experience for end investors is definitely poorer 
than it is in the US when I look at where ETFs broadly are executed. So I can't help but think that that does have something to do with accessing larger pools of liquidity in a single venue. The second item I, I would stress is I think that there are market structure changes that are needed in Europe. Um, and I also think that there is policy, anything around policy that can come to fruition that also drives just greater transparency and a more of an even playing field for all investor types, in particular for retail, to access the same data and information to make those informed decisions, I think is going to be helpful. So again, you know, without harping on to the point, the real-time transaction data that is made available in the US is absolutely a game changer. And, and I look forward, as I said earlier in my comments, to seeing that come to fruition in the marketplace over here, because I think that type of a structural change benefits all investors. Thank you very much. We will, in the next round, get back to a little bit, you know, what concrete policy measures could be useful here. You have mentioned a lot between yourselves here uh, already, but we will still come back to that in the uh, in the next round. Uh, retail investment was, well, I think, a very important point just mentioned by uh, Gunjan, and that's a perfect bridge to, to Johan, because Sweden has, of course, uh, in contrast maybe to some of the other markets in Europe, a... I guess a long tradition of uh, citizens taking, um, you know, buying shares, giving the grandchildren shares for the birthday and, and all that. So um, please speak a little bit to the Swedish experience here. And it does come up a lot. And, and um, I, of course, I'm a little bit biased here being Swedish by passport myself, but I think it is interesting to see how the Swedish example is being mentioned a lot in, in the various uh, panels and conferences these days. So, but, you know, we should listen to the person who actually know how it works there. So please, Johan. Thank you, Paulina. Well, let me try to mention a few features of the Swedish system. Also, just to add nuance, um, I think our capital markets do work well. Um, that said, there is a trade-off here, I think, between returns to scale, what seems to be efficiency from consolidation on the one hand, and also safeguarding competition. I should make it clear, Sweden is a small country. We have 10 million people. We have two regulated markets. We also have three SME growth markets. Uh, so there is actually quite a lot of competition, even within that small um, system, and our largest uh, trading venue is not owned by the same company as the CST in Sweden either. So I think it's not all about consolidation, and uh, that echoes what I think some other people have said it too, um, worth bearing in mind. I think also it's important to see the sort of local ecosystem around a well-functioning market for issuers. Uh, you have all these legal financial advisory uh, capacities that really, I think, take a long time to build. And once you have them in place, I think they're very beneficial for issuers, but they're also beneficial for other players in the local financial market. So in that sense, a sweeping consolidation in this area in Europe would probably have some negative consequences um, in, in, in some member states. I think we should be wary of that, at least, uh, recognize that there's some sort of trade-off there. Um, third, then, coming into the retail, more the retail investor perspective, um, I think uh, it was a good point uh, made earlier here uh, by Peter about interoperability. I mean, really, from the, for the retail investor, I think it's, it's two things that we should be encouraging. One is exposure to stock markets, for sure. But the second is proper diversification. These tend to be the two big glaring errors in household portfolios. Not enough stocks and not enough diversification. So exposure to stocks, Sweden has done very well. The, the ISK that was mentioned, thank you for the kind words. Um, it's uh, basically a, an equity-friendly tax treatment, uh, directly held stocks from mutual funds, no lock-in. You can sell, get out whenever you want. You don't realize any, you don't get any more taxes when you realize capital gains, actual distributions aren't taxed. Basically, you pay something like 1% to 1.5% a year, more or less like a flat rate, um, and then you don't have any other um, taxes or really paperwork. So it's very simple, very equity-friendly. I, sh I should say it was introduced in 2012, and now out of those 10 million people I mentioned, 4 million have an ISK, and the assets in the ISK are about one-third of GDP. So that's pretty successful. Um, it's not coming out of nowhere. It's the most recent version of some way putting a wrapper somehow around uh, savings with a uh, stock market exposure, but it's, it's the one that's been the most clearly targeted towards directly held stocks. Um, I should say one last feature of that product is that it's 
it's not a savings product really in itself. There's no, there's no layer in between. It's a way of keeping track. Did you or did you not pre-select to have that tax treatment? You can't decide later on because then everything that performs really well, you would tax it like that. And everything else you would tax in the conventional way and deduct losses. So you have to pre-select this treatment. So it's, it's really a matter of keeping accounts. Did you or did you not pre-select for this tax treatment? So when this was introduced in 2012, I was at the Ministry of Finance also then, um, it was very clear in the communication that there was an expectation that this would be a very cheap thing to have. To have an ISK would probably be provided for free or at a very low fee, and that's also what happened. So you get directly held stocks with really a minimum fee or no fee for that little bit of intermediation. Again, that's another feature to make it more, more friendly. So I think for, for Swedish households, what's really missing there is easier access to diversifying, diversifying portfolios across Europe. Now they can do it relatively easily through users funds, other ways too. But to do it for directly held stocks, if you go out and buy you know, Adidas shoes, take a an example, and you think, this, this is a good product, I like this company, maybe I should have some stocks in this company. That's going to be more difficult than if it's you know, Volvo trucks. It's not obvious why that should be the case in the future. So I think interoperability is going to be a key word here, though. It doesn't have to be a matter of consolidation only. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. I think there is one element here which would be, you know, would merit its own panel, which we don't have much time for today. And that's, I think, Commissioner referenced it before. And that's, I think, the whole financial uh, competence and financial education piece, which, of course, is also a really important part of this retail, uh, retail conversation. You know, if we get, we want consumers to to be more active in capital markets, we need to make sure that they get a good deal and that they get good advice and that they, of course, understand what they're doing. But again, that's another debate for another day. Uh, so we've spoken a little bit about the Nordics. So we now go to, to Central Europe. Um, Peter, you've already, I mean, mentioned some of the things that I think you, you know, s seem to suggest that they're holding some developments back. But um, what are the further challenges that you see from that Central European perspective? Uh, thank you, Paulina. Maybe you were previously saying that we could react on the, our our speakers before us you know so well i i almost promised to myself that i will not say the world consolidated tape but um yeah I, i'm just very glad what uh, what gunchan was saying you know that the consolidated tape and the, the perspective of state street that finally somewhere gonna be access for the data of the trades which are done otc dark pools and si's as i understand it right uh, Perfect. It's a pity that the investors really didn't say it uh, five years ago. We could have spent uh, tons of mental activity, days and nights of discussions because, you know, um, it could have been done very easily. You know, consolidated tape from exchanges are on Bloomberg and Reuters. And if we just, there will be a rule that all the SIs, OTC and uh, dark pools and MTF should also contribute to these two providers, which have duopoly, could have been done three years ago. I don't know why it was not done like this. You know, we were also always arguing as the exchanges that our tape is out there. The problem is the missing of the data, not that our tape is not out there. So perfect, great to hear it, unfortunately too late. Uh, now we're going to develop a new thing, which will cost a lot of the things. We are very happy to participate in as exchanges and looking forward uh, that it will improve the market. But I think it could have been done easier. Um, another thing on consolidation, um, consolidation of the exchanges. Um, what is the most expensive thing you are running if you are running a financial company in the moment? You are running an IT as the most expensive then there is there is some legal cost you know usually huge legal cost for uh, for regulation and whatever of course the personal but but you know i mean like uh business wise then you can spend fortune on marketing but you don't have to you know mandatory are those two things so let's focus on it we exchanges as a segment we innovate we i think we are running state-of-art systems and 90 percent of the trading in europe is running on just three systems after you will finish your merger, it's going to be probably 99% of four systems. The most important, the most difficult, and most costly part we already did. There are just four systems, basically, like IT systems. I don't mean the exchanges, but the IT systems. All of the investment banks in the whole world have four, these four systems, or will have these four, now we have four, these three systems in front of their nose. 
All of them have their also Bloomberg and Refinitiv, and that's the technical equipment they basically need for accessing any market in Europe in the moment. So IT-wise, I would say we cannot go much further. So th th there is a problem actually on the legal side there. Euronext, and I think you will you will hear it from Stefan later on, you know, is consolidating the markets in Western Europe for almost 20 years. You know, we were trying to do the same thing in Vienna, and uh, actually we don't have anybody from Nasdaq, you know, doing the same thing in, uh, in uh, Nordic area. From my experience, we had, as a Wiener Börse, I was also the president of Ljubljana Stock Exchange, and we said, okay, it, it's so small, the euro, let's try to really, really merge it. You know, just to give out the Slovenian license and merge it onto one license. Such a thick file came from the lawyers and they said, Lass, you, are, you are mad. It's impossible. It's just legally impossible to do it. You cannot just take the whole market. You can cherry pick. You can pick up three or four big securities, move it onto your main market, and they'll leave the rest there to die it up there. But you cannot in take the entire market and integrate it into another market, you know, because the regulators would have to agree on how they're going to do the things, you know, if, if there is a straight in a Slovenian security on the other markets. Simply the lawyer explanation, I don't want to go to the detail, was like, forget it. You will spend the fortune and you will never achieve it. Also, we were looking now in the Prague, Vienna, and we, then we realized, you know, that uh, it's actually nonsense, you know, because, uh, and now I'm coming to, the, to another buzzword, single pool of liquidity. What is it? When, when somebody says this word, you know, I have to be asked, you know, what do you exactly mean by single pool of liquidity? Is it like all the members on the exchange are trading something, this is a single pool of liquidity, regardless what is listed there? Because not all the members are trading everything. There are some members who are passive investors, they are trading just the index. So it doesn't automatically, and we're speaking daily to issuers, to check issuers, it doesn't automatically mean that if they are listed on London Stock Exchange, they have the same investors as Royal Dutch Shell. They don't, because they are coming from the different world, they are in the different indices. Back to the index problem, of course. And Prague and Vienna is, Vienna is developed market for 50 years, Prague is so-called emerging market. We are still emerging for 30 years. And we ever going to be if there are no change in the rule. So we have the same pool of liquidity. Yes, yeah, same institutions are members there. But completely different pools of liquidity are trading the stocks, which are Austrian stocks and Czech stocks, Hungarian the same way. So this, this fiction of the single pool of liquidity, if, if, you, if you're speaking and you are not from the industry, I was sitting for years in front of the, on the desk and I was a trader. You know, just you know, let it be explained what exactly the person who is speaking about single pool of liquidity means and how it can be touched, the single pool of liquidity. Thank you. And we're then moving on to um, Athanasiov. And maybe I think the, the bridge actually from what Peter was spoke, speaking about, the local exchanges and the difficulties that um, were clearly um, in the lawyer and, and the big file and, and all that. I think that also goes a little bit to the question that you were asking Commissioner McGuinness uh, earlier. I mean, the role of local exchanges, if ever one managed to do the merger despite all the legal difficulties. I mean, what is your perspective on that? I mean, it's kind of the, the local perspective from the local investor and his possibilities to, to then access capital, then no longer locally perhaps, but, but somewhere else. Yeah, I, I will uh, talk from the perspective of the issuer trying to find uh, uh, cross-border investing or internal market investing and not local investing. Uh, the main problems are uh, the following. First of all, uh, local companies are usually under uh, the radar of uh, uh, main uh, institutional investors. Uh, there is too little information about them, uh, little investment research, and uh, the rules of MIFID II on investment research actually made things worse. And there were many market participants and academics that they said that at the point that they were institutional, uh, they were uh, issued. Second, second, for Greek companies, for example, there are linguistic barriers. There is little information because they have everything in Greek. Nobody speaks Greek. Yeah, 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 yes, sorry. Uh, second, there the, the, are linguistic barriers. For example, for Greek companies, everything is in Greek. And uh, if they want to have more information, they need to translate everything uh, to English. Third, 
let's be frank about this. Uh, and it applies in most European companies. They are small in size, with little free float and little liquidity. And these are not good fundamentals for a cross-border uh, investing. Uh, and all these fourth are translated to cost. Going public elsewhere, except from your local market, is extremely more expensive than doing that locally. And we have not done anything about this. And this is not only the issue of uh, the capital uh, raise at the first. It's also living with foreign investors expensive. And this uh, translates to the role of proxy advisors. There are so many peculiarities in local corporate laws and local laws uh, that uh, make the, uh, the relationship between issuers and foreign investors very, very problematic. I will tell you an example. Uh, in Greece, we have uh, a, a, a preemption right for existing shareholders that works in priority to other investors. Uh, this means that you need to do that serially, first for your investors and then for, uh, 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 for your shareholders and for other investors. When all Greek systemic banks wanted to recapitalize after the crisis, they abolished this uh, right and they replaced it with a simultaneous allocation right, priority allocation right, same, it works the same way economically, but it was not the preemption right. Uh, uh, just for reasons of uh, speedness. Okay. Uh, all proxy advisors advised against voting in favor of the capital increase. And it was really a nightmare persuading foreign investors in 48 hours in order for these banks to go off with uh, their recapitalization scheme. So this is a very clear example. Uh, sixth, uh, Moving uh, uh, cross-border for issuers or doing dual listing is also very problematic because it will require a domiciliation. All Greek companies that they wanted to do a listing, they needed to redomicile in Belgium. And when they go there, they understand they're too small for a bigger market. There is a say that say better second in a village than first in, in, the Ro in Rome. Okay. And Always we need to understand that we have national barriers and we have country risk. And if you are domiciled in Greece, then during the debt crisis, the sovereign debt crisis, you are non-investable anyhow. So these are all barriers that they cannot uh, somehow eliminate by changing the law or something like this. They're inherent in how Europe works. So. Uh, this is for me. I will keep my proposals in the last uh, answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's, it's, it's interesting indeed that we, of course, speak a lot about uh, what can be done. Uh, I think the top uh, down versus the bottom up was mentioned by Ms. Calvino and, and others. But obviously, uh, one aspect here, and I think it was very clear in, in, in your uh, intervention, Athanasios, is of course also the the more, I mean, the linguistic barriers, the um, cultural, the, you know, the kind of, in a way, probably also Europe's richness that we are so different, uh, but that of course these are not things that we can regulate away at, at, at the European level. We're going to move into the last round before we will take a few questions from the, um, from the audience. I think the discussion has already been uh, very, very rich. What I would want the panelists to uh, please focus on in this last round is a little bit the policy implications. And, a lot has been mentioned already in terms of the role of SIs, consolidated tape, uh, tax incentives, uh, pension systems, corporate law, um, insolvency laws. So I think you have already touched on a lot of um, issues here. So I'm going to make it a little bit more difficult for you now. So if you were to advise the next commissioner coming in responsible for financial services, we are of course at an interesting political juncture as what been referenced in earlier conversations. What is the one measure in terms of policy changes that you would think would really make a difference uh, for capital markets union uh, going forward so i would i would ask you to keep it to to one measure so we will we will try that and i'm starting by going back to um, to you peter 
Well, surprising question, and uh, <clears throat> immediately I'm first one to say, uh, to speak. Um, no, I, I think, you know, there should be done something on the on the supervision, really. You know, we need, uh, there will be next panel about that. Uh, we need to scrap some of the local gold plating, um, uh, make all the decisions uh, same for same question, the same answer in every country. I, I'm not calling for one European SEC. I think it would not be really effective, but uh, there should be very much unified in their decision making. Uh, uh, they uh, they should have a single outcome, um, and that's what I mean, uh, or similar outcomes, very similar outcomes, you know, for the same question. And uh, uh, we we should we should kill the things like that. If you have a prospectus approved in one country, you have to be reapproved in another country to in order to uh, be uh, available for the investors in the country and 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 various things like this, which will uh, which I think it's still low hanging fruit actually, mm -hmm. because you have to speak only to the uh, to the to the regulators and uh, <laughs> only. Um, I understand that many countries, I think including my country, are very uh, easily be touched, you know, when anybody speaks about the about the taxes. So from the outside point of view, you would think that this uh, withholding tax harmonization would be the easiest. But I know that there are some politicians, uh, they hear the word tax, that they are immediately, you know, protecting their national interest, although they don't understand what is it withholding tax on the dividend and that it's uh, would really be profitable for everybody. So I think that would be more difficult, but the, but the regulation situation probably uh, is, for me, from a little bit knowledge of the, of what is it uh, about in Europe is, uh, it's probably easier to get. Thank you very much, Peter. I'm not. I don't want to put put words in your mouth, but I guess on the supervisory side, coherence and consistency a little bit among the practices. I guess that is. Uh, oh, absolutely. You, you worded it much better than me. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I'd say same question, same answer for for a really really easy easy explanation, but not from one central body because that would make it probably administratively more difficult and expensive. And I would say the best would be if the if all the regulation decisions on all Europe would go only in English, you know, that they are accessible immediately by the by the other countries. Same question, same answer. We will bring that to the panel after lunch uh, for their, because they will have a discussion around around uh, supervision. Excellent, Peter. And I turn then to Athanas. Sorry, I to your warrior. I'm sorry about pronunciation. Yeah, Athanas, yes. It's missing more. It means it means immortal in Greek. Okay. <laughs> well, um, I will say we need to focus on two different things. First one, it is uh, infrastructure. Second, is the financial product, the listed company itself. With respect to uh, infrastructure, I think it is important that we go to a harmonisation of supervisors, supervisor harmonisation at a European level. Uh, many supervisors mean different uh, um, uh, supervisory approach and interpretation of basic rules. Market abuse, different interpretation in various uh, member states, uh, listed uh, um, transfer of securities, different interpretation in, 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 numbers, in a number of member states. So we need uh, ESMA to be a single supervisor for cross-border transactions and for, a comp for companies with a, a certain market capitalization and over. Second, we need uh, a single order book. And in order to do that, we can use the uh, example of the target to securities. So at central bank level, at European central bank level, we can have something like, a, a, not, not a new exchange, but some, a, a supra a meta, uh, um, a supranational meta exchange infrastructure where all internalizers, all uh, exchanges, uh, all investment fees feed the, uh, their orders or the order routing system the same. In this way, we have a consolidated debt. Okay. Uh, third, uh, in terms of financial products, we need to provide incentive for bigger companies and with greater free float. If we don't do that, we have the super uh, infrastructure, but we don't have the products to offer. Okay. 
this means we need to revisit the uh, takeover directive in terms of uh, because we cannot have a single market if we don't have a proper market for corporate control. Okay, and also we need to, uh, and I'm finishing. We need to uh, emphasize on the role of private equity because this is uh, uh, the catalyst for uh, better and more listings. Uh, um, it is an exit for them. So we need to see uh, the rules for the distribution to retailers. To retailers, this is national law right now. It's not uh, harmonized. Uh, we need to introduce uh, new new types of uh, regulations, like the Uvica regulation for green bonds, for tech, uh, for green funds, tech funds, uh, uh, etc. Uh, and for all this, we can use. We need to focus on technology. On, uh, and uh, blockchain, artificial intelligence is there and will help us to uh, provide uh, for better uh, regulation, uh, better systems, better integration. Thank you. Thank you. I think in general, the role of technology, absolutely, I think, in all the developments going forward. The question is, I guess, then what, you know, how we can make sure that policy uh, measures accompany also these technological changes. And, and by the way, the commission was mentioning earlier the AI consultation in the financial sector that we are going to, to be doing uh, shortly. Javier, your policy measure, your one policy measure. <laughs> it's unfair. I've heard many already. Eh? Uh, I need to say, Atanasios, we need to have a coffee, you and I, because I disagree with 80% of what you said. <laughs> uh, so it has to be a coffee with dessert, I think, uh, probably. So it's a long, a long debate. I, uh... A four-course lunch, I also suggest. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I, if, I, if I have to summarize what is really worrying me, and not, uh, honestly, I'm not worried about uh, some of those things. What worries me is how the equity market in Europe can really develop. And uh, we always, I mean, we have this uh, paradigm of looking to ourselves like infrastructure. So everything depends on the infrastructure, no? whether we have one, we have two, three, whatever. And I think that is important, but we are missing the point. The, miss the point to me is why do we have such a limited uh, investment in equity? And the more we talk about ourselves, the worse. Because the, the real situation is that, to, in a Spanish image, sorry for this, to grab the bull by the horns and not, not talk about uh, no, the fizzy stuff, is that we need to make the equity European market much more attractive than what it is today. That is the problem. I mean, when you talk to issuers, talking to issuers to me is humbling. Because all of a sudden, when you're dealing with the daily things, trading, clearing, post-trade, then all of a sudden you go to talk to your, your customers, and your customers don't have a clue on that. And you don't, they don't care. They, they, they trust us. Somebody talked about trust. They trust that we do the thing, the right things and we fulfill regulation. The question is why they're not listing. Why are they not listing? Are we addressing that question here? No, we're not. Why uh, SMEs take so long to, get, to come to exchange? Why? Why retailers are not investing? Why? Is it because of the clearing, because of the settlement, because of the trading? In my opinion, it's not. I, I totally buy your arguments on difficulties and, and, and cost of transaction for ETFs. But you wouldn't have an ETF if, the, if companies wouldn't be there. No? So we need to start for the raw material. The raw material is the issuers and the investors. And the issuers and the investors are not, are not providing with IPOs, we're not providing with volumes because we don't have the right incentives to be equity. For example, we talked about the DEBRA. So how long is it going to take us to equalize the tax incentive to be uh, leverage in debt or leverage in equity? How long is this going to take us? 30 years? 40 years? 100 years? It's very obvious that it's much better for, for P&L to do, to do it in debt because obviously this income is tax deductible. Okay, we know that. We've talked about it. There is even a draft. When is this going to be passed? Never? So why? I mean, what are we talking about? We're talking about retailers. Totally, I would like to be uh, Swedish, by the way. I mean, it's, it's absolutely what we have proposed in Spain is exactly to do something like that or what we have in the US, which is, do we really want retailers to be in the market? Are we doing anything for that? We're doing nothing. Nothing at all. That's not only a question which I, I buy eh, of, of uh, granting the opportunities that are coming in different European exchanges to, for them to invest and, and make it seamless. I totally buy that. But the question is, 
How on earth is anybody going to invest in equity if the tax authorities are greedy enough to take every single euro that falls out of your wallet into their hands? Are you asking people to save in equities? They will never do it. They will never do it unless we take all tax authorities in Europe and discuss why we don't have retail investment in Europe. And I tell you my humble opinion, if we provide with them with an element, an instrument like this, like the American one or the Swiss one, and we tell them, look, if you save in equity, you have a, a parachute of tax protection until you dispose of them or until you retire, then we might see a result. But what is this thing of capital markets? You know, the time talking about retailers, retailers, and we do nothing. There's nothing in the, on the table to solve it, nothing at all. We've done a lot, retail investment. I know I totally buy that. I don't want to be unfair. There's a lot of regulation that has been passed in terms of transparency and better regulation. I totally buy that. But if we want to really reinvigorate the buy side, nothing is being done. What is, what is happening to pension funds? Everything else, we talked about it. What, what is on the table, actually? And we're talking about consolidation, and we're missing the point. The point is that the raw material, the issuers, and the, and the investors are not finding the right incentives in the European market. And unless we put them to, to, to work, and we put the right focus of the next commission into those topics, solvency, role, uh, rule, taxation, etc., we will never get it. We just will never get it. We'll be here in five years talking about exactly the same topic, exactly the same topic. So either we put the focus into what is really a game changer in the European market, or we'll never get it, honestly. Sorry, I have a very strong view on this. I mean, I get, I get a, thank you. It's very good. We like strong views. And I also promised the audience that there would be some disagreement on the on the panel. No, I mean, jokes jokes apart, I think the, if we look at what the European leaders said in the conclusion in April on CMU, the importance of CMU, but also being quite you know, specific on, on the various areas that had been identified, which, by the way, I think is similar to what the finance minister have discussed as well. You know, insolvency, uh, retail participation, taxation, it, it is all there. But then, of course, now uh, the issue will be to, to really make it happen in practice, as you, as you, as you say. Gunjan, your recommendation. Yeah, I think um, I'm going to focus on market structure and it will um, touch upon some of what's already been mentioned. But for me, you know, I think the opportunity to, and I'll leverage what Johan shared earlier, to get to a place where there's greater interoperability, um, you know, perhaps above even consolidation, um, I think is key. And there are tremendous opportunities to strengthen and improve the market structure of the capital markets in this region. Um, the specifics I'll share around that is look at the US. And again, I think it's important just to look at what's happening globally and we shouldn't have our heads in the sands like ostriches. So I just mention it for the purposes of an example because there could be a helpful lesson for us. There are four major exchanges that are in the US. Yet they have managed to stitch that data together but still have tremendous competition that benefits the end investor. So for me, I'm thinking, how do we bring elements of that to Europe? And if there is greater interoperability uh, to, to really give and not fragment the insights and information for investors, but to really harness and perhaps find a way to stitch that together, hypothetically, where there might be one listing, but the opportunity for investors to trade in multiple different places, over different exchanges. I'm curious whether technology could help evolve the market structure across the landscape over here to benefit the investor experience. Investors will go where they see the greatest benefit for them to execute, and they need the right information to do that. So I'm going to touch upon that theme. And I'll also draw upon another one that was briefly touched upon, incentives. I'm looking at incentives that might exist for market makers, for the liquidity providers on exchange to really, again, harness the best experience for the end investor. There are some of the most aggressive market-making incentive programs that I've seen actually on Asian exchanges and on US exchanges, and I think that's an area that Europe has a real opportunity to look at as well. Not just lead market-making incentive programs, but what about secondary market-making programs as well to bring on a secondary market maker and really start to entice and do a double click there. I think those are some of the market structure opportunities um, that exist to be able to strengthen further. Thank you. And then the, the final word here to you before the questions from the audience to you, Yuan. 
Thank you. It's uh, very hard to single out one measure. I think it's really about uh, a multitude of measures. A lot of this is about plumbing. And as if anyone's lived in an old house, it's extremely imp important to have good plumbing. But uh, that said, if I single one thing out, I think it would be the demand side to really try to make concerted efforts across Europe to, to boost demand uh, from retail investors for stocks. And I think uh, that's an attractive way forward because you really kill two birds with one stone. The first is that we have to believe, we should believe that it's good for households in the long run to have exposure to risky assets in their portfolios. And there's a lot of evidence across Europe of that not being the case. So there's something to address there. It might mean more risk in the short run, but actually improved economic security in the long run and at old age. The other bird being killed with the same stone is to try to promote this development that we've been talking about uh, throughout this session. I think we shouldn't underestimate the power, the innovative power of all the firms involved here. And really there has been a lot of innovation going on um, that has to do with consolidation, but also has to do with, uh, with, with interoperability, like you were just saying. And if retail investors to a greater extent are, are demanding these services or the, the intermediaries acting on their behalf, that's also going to put pressure on the firms. It's going to put pressure on the regulators and the legislators. And that's going to hopefully help to bring these things forward. Um, so that's the one that I would that would I would push for. I think it's apart from the ISK and the tax treatment and keeping it simple. I think um, it's also really important to think about the pension system and about the funded pillars there. Because if your government or your employer is not sending a signal that you should trust the stock market for your long run savings, then you know what's that saying, right? So so that's a good place to start. I think. Second, for if you're thinking about products like the ASK, let me just re repeat and emphasize that it's really a very simple and very cheap uh, product in a sense, or a wrapper, um, and it doesn't have a lock-in based on age. So you're not risking an offset against liquid buffers. Households need to have liquid buffers if they suddenly face unemployment or a severe recession. So the, these, these savings are not locked in the way they would be in a pension product. In addition, there are no constraints on whether these are securities that are issued in, say, Sweden, or for that math matter, the EU. And I mention that because of some of the things that have been discussed already under the banner of this uh, savings and investment union. Uh, some of the suggestions put forward would be to sort of try to, to encourage uh, these products to contain securities issued within the EU. Home bias among retail investors is an extremely robust empirical finding. You will have an, a massive overrepresentation of domestic and EU securities in these things anyway. I think to actually go in there as a regulator, legislator, and really sort of uh, damage the risk reward trade off here also sends a very bad signal. So I think be wary of that. That would be another piece of advice linked to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not going to, to attempt to, to summarize the panel. I think it's been very, very rich and is super interesting. I was, I mean, Johan started by his first introduction by saying, you know, the glass, the famous glass, which is half full or half empty. I got a little bit of sense on this panel that the glass maybe is more half empty than half full, but let's stay positive. Uh, it is half full and we have a lot of measures identified, actions identified that need to go into our famous glass. We have, um, I know you're all looking forward to, to lunch, but we have a couple of minutes left, so we will take a few questions from the audience. And uh, yes, I see a lot of hands going up already. Uh, I'll start with um, the lady here in the, in the middle, and can you please introduce yourselves? Thank you very much, Jacqueline Mills from the Association for Financial Markets in Europe. Um, very interesting panel, lots of uh, diverse views. I, I, I think there m might have been one area of um, consensus towards the end, and, and that's the, the question I'd like to ask. But first, I'd like to sort of stress a, a few figures um, on the liquidity landscape. And it still puzzles me that um, there are these ongoing debates about uh, where liquidity is, um, 
and, and how much of it is addressable, I think that might be one of the first issues that could um, reasonably be looked at. Um, and we know that ESMA and others are making efforts to, to sort of standardize these approaches, but it still seems strange that we can't really understand the liquidity landscape in the EU. Um, or at least have a common understanding of that. Um, and when we look at data which tries to identify where addressable liquidity is, the shares of on-venue and off-venue trading are more or less stable over time, and on-venue trading in the EU is about 70%. And systematic internalizers are providing a function that exchanges can't um, because systematic internalizers are putting their capital at risk to enable trading, whereas as, as exchanges are providing um, that sort of forum for um, matching interests to come together. So I think the two are important complements instead of substitutes. And that sort of brings me to um, the point that I think fragmentation is very interesting to look at when it comes to looking at um, the differences along national lines, rather than in terms of the choices of trading uh, modalities that are made available for um, uh, investors and which are very helpful and useful for investors. Um, and so I'm curious to understand how panelists think that um, we can stitch together the data, I think, as Gojan said, and encourage interoperability while allowing that competition in practice. So the concept, I think, is there, and I think the panel more or less agreed on that. But in practice, what are the actions uh, to take to, um, to sort of move forward with that? Thank you. Sorry for the rather long question. Uh, Javier, do you want to, who wants to come in on this? Ola, Gunjan, please. Yeah, I, I can start, um, and perhaps others want to chime in. So, um, so look, I'm going to go to the point that Peter made. You know, I, I absolutely wish we did have the transparency of a, a real-time data feed that was showing the the, the real-time price transparency with the consolidated tape five years ago, but I will say better late than never. Um, and if we're looking forward, so let's think glass half full rather than half empty, we're certainly going to benefit all investors of the future once that does come to fruition in the marketplace. And I think that goes a long way to helping with the interoperability because it provides that transparency to all investor types, hopefully of all of the venues coming to the table, um, where that will then exist to show where is execution, where is the level of execution that is occurring from, you know, one security, whatever the underlying might be. I think that's crucially important. The second point I'll make is you spoke about not being substitutes on exchange or off exchange venues, but perhaps comp complements. I would just ask us to question how does the even the substitute effect if we if we go with that theory that you'd mentioned benefit the end investor and I'm talking about the retail investor that will not have neither the systems nor perhaps the right level of information to understand what's going on in the off exchange venues that they might need to be informed about to make their own decisions of execution. And the US market, again, just to kind of use that one, they've clearly managed to, to really bring volume on exchange to a greater extent than perhaps other parts of the world. And again, I touched upon some of the market making incentive schemes. They are bringing those same liquidity providers who are putting their balance sheet and capital at risk to do the off exchange trading onto exchange to be able to incentivize the trading to occur on that venue. Thank you. Anyone else want to? And please we, we keep it just, short. I want to take agree. a moment. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I fully signed this, you know. I'm also going to be happy if on the future consolidated tape going to be finally all the data, all the data. And, and frankly, this is what to, I proposed previously. I mean, it's, uh, in any infrastructure uh, at ECB level, which will uh, consolidate all data, is a single order book. Everything will need to feed real time the information, whether it is a systemic internalizer or it is um, um, uh, an exchange. We have the same step, uh, price step. So I think this is feasible. Okay, we take. Two more questions, and please keep your questions. Okay, three, because three people are their hands up. So please keep your questions short, and we will try to do short replies uh, as well. Uh, should we go? I think I have Nicola in the back first, but please, no, it's fine. 
Pablo Portugal from Euroclear. Uh, thank you very much for a, a lively panel. Uh, maybe a couple observations on the on the question of um, consolidation of infrastructures. Although I agree that this is not the only driver of the of the CMU, as has been pointed out. Uh, clearly, if we look at the European landscape, there has been a degree of consolidation at group level among infrastructures and, and the groups, uh, you know, uh, represented. Um, what we have is many legal entities, many national CSDs. So an, an interesting question to, to look at is, you know, what, what prevents um, a, a more mergers between CSDs, more, more consolidation, uh, you know, when it comes to the legal entities, you know? Um, for example, uh, in the case of Ireland, uh, there is no national CSD there, and that was driven by a, a big event, which was Brexit. So uh, the Irish securities were onboarded into a, a, a European infrastructure, another infrastructure. And um, so for that to happen, the, the member state had to agree to that. It's a question, you know, uh, to get the national agreement, and, uh, and the Irish market had to agree to that. So. FMIs can only do as much as their ecosystem allows them to do. Uh, so I, I think in looking at this question, you know, in the future, we, we also need to, maybe that's a question for the, the state secretary as well, uh, look at um, what are member states prepared to agree to when it comes to Europeanization of infrastructures. Uh, you know, and this involves questions of national sovereignty, of local ecosystems, etc. cetera. Uh, as a final point, I would, I would very much echo the remarks uh, around um, you know, in the you know, aside from consolidation, we need to ensure that the we achieve true market integration via uh, interoperability, open access, competition between uh, different infrastructures. In the CSD space, for example, uh, we have a passporting regime uh, that has been recently simplified, but it has been very painful to make it work effectively to obtain a, a passport. So the the Commission and the the, the co-legislators have. Um, simplified it in the CSDR refit. We will need to see how that works in practice, but we need to really look at um, removing those barriers to true competition in the single market, and, and maybe, maybe that can be a trigger towards further consolidation. Thank you. I think in the interest of time, we're going to group the question, and please do keep your questions short. We can continue the conversation during the, the lunch break uh, later. Uh, Nicola? Uh, uh, Nicolas Veron at uh, Bruegel and Peterson Institute for International Economics. So a brief question indeed. Uh, several of you referred to interoperability. Apparently the current supervisory architecture is unable to deliver that. So what degree of supervisory integration would be necessary? Uh, that's uh, probably uh, more question to uh, Johan and to Mrs. Chohan. Um, for interoperability to be workable. Thank you. And we take the final question here. Thank you, Rafael Plata from the European Association of Clearing Houses. Um, I I was very interested to hear the comments by Johan um, about the fact that this is not really about consolidation. There's other uh, issues that really drive capital markets. And I was astonished really with the figures that you mentioned. So you just run past through them, but if I got them correctly, um, the ISK, has unlocked about uh, one third, uh, well, equal to an amount equal to about one third of the GDP in Sweden. Transposing that into EU numbers, we would be talking about five trillion euros uh, if we did that one third of the EU GDP. And I would like to hear, perhaps from Ihan and from the others, would you agree that the key for the ISK success would be, I think you mentioned simplicity and taxation, as uh, Javier was saying, perhaps we're missing the points so of tax taxation. And to you, Paulina, I don't know if you can answer questions, but uh, in relation to taxation, similar to the question that I asked to Commissioner before, um, would you think that DG FISMAP can actually drive, I know it's not your remit, but could they actually drive some change uh, into taxation that could be meaningful to capital markets? Thank you. Thank you. Always happy to, to answer questions. I will let the panelists speak first. So we have the question around CSD uh, consolidation. We have the question around interoperability and what level of supervision we would need to achieve that interoperability and the uh, what are the key factors for the success of the ISK, which I think Yuan will have to, to reply to. So I will maybe start with you, Yuan, and then uh, the panelists, if you want to come in. Thank you. Uh, very good questions. Let me try to say something briefly on all three. Uh, first, the CSD question. No, I, I, I think we have the same perspective there. It would probably be a mistake to sort of force a uh, drastic consolidation of CSDs without thinking about why we have the current landscape. 
it seems, and I think this point has been made previously today, to be very much about having still a lot of national legal frameworks that, in a sense, makes it rational to have CSDs at the, at, at the local level. From a single market perspective, perhaps some of those differences in legal frameworks in the long run uh, won't necessarily have to be there. My advice to the Commission in that case will be to, to sort of try to think about a very realistic timeline for that. We're talking about uh, very, very difficult reforms when it comes to company law and solvency law. Um, I'm an economist, not a legal expert, but I realize this is a very daunting task and it certainly goes beyond, I think, a single cycle uh, in Brussels. So you really have to think very far ahead and think what are the logical steps for that kind of work. Um, the question of 28th regime, if that, is a, if that is a good route or not, I think that's a very difficult question. Uh, it's also been mentioned maybe a coalition of the willing. Well, that's interesting if there really is a coalition of the willing. Uh, if so, please make yourselves known. Uh, that could be a good idea. Uh, second, I'm moving on to Nicolas Veron's question about, uh, about the, the supervision. I think it's pretty clear that in this area, um, because there has been a lot of consolidation at the group level, so you have these parent companies that are active in a number of jurisdictions, and they're interacting a lot with different systems for super, well, different supervisory practices, some difference in regulations, but also different reporting uh, platforms and, and standards and so on. I think to the extent that that can converge, maybe reporting at the central level should also be considered. Um, to think about what the role for, for ESMA should be uh, in all this, and in that case, what is required of ESMA uh, to take a bigger role in this, in that case. That's a very interesting discussion to have. And uh, it doesn't have to be about centralizing supervision. It could also just be about making those borders a little bit less of a salient uh, threshold and less of a cost. Um, finally, then, to talk about the ISK a bit more. Uh, very happy to do that. I think, um, yes, those, uh, those numbers were correct. Um, I think really four things are important if you want to design something like the ISK. And the first is the simplicity. So, so with the conventional method of taxing savings, which is also still in place, by the way, remember, so this is an optional tax treatment. You, you're taxed not only on, on distributions like dividends and coupons, you're also taxed on realized capital gains. And to do that, you have to keep track of what you bought the shares for and what you sold them for. You might have splits, you might have mergers, this is actually really difficult for a lot of retail investors to do. So getting rid of that paperwork was in itself a big rationale for introducing the product, uh, because also our, our tax uh, authority knew that so many people just made human mistakes trying to calculate that. Um, I would also stress the no fee or low fee element. You do not want this to be a sort of insurance style product with very little insurance in it, that then adds another 50 or 100 basis points of fees uh, you want to keep that very close to zero or at zero. And finally, just to repeat that point, no lock-ins. There are no requirements on these issuers being in Sweden or in the EU. There is no lock-in in terms of the time that your money has to be there. It is, of course, an ideal product for long-term savings, but you can also use it as a liquid buffer. With regards to the tax treatment, it's basically the risk-free rate, the, long, uh, the current rate on long government bonds plus 1%. That's the standard rate. So rather than your actual returns, that's the sort of standard return that you're taxed at. The risk-free rate plus 1%. Everyone in here probably has their own estimate of the equity premium, but you can relate that estimate to that and you can think about which of your savings you would like to have in this account and whether it's attractive or not. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else wants to come in on, on any or all of, the, of these three questions? Very quickly, on the, uh, on the CSD consolidation, um, you have a limited experience. You have one CSD. You come from Euroclear. How many CSDs do you operate? Uh, maybe the question is for you, in the sense of why haven't you, as Euroclear, the, gone for a consolidation of all the CSDs that you manage in Europe? The, the Irish example, I think, is good. Huh? But, I, but, but again, I think there are... There are several elements on, in, case of, in the case of everything that has to do with the law, with corporate law, with I mean, that uh, obviously when you when you are a, a company from whichever country, your natural choice is to go to your own notary, to the notary you have near near you, not to say, hey, I, I want to list in the, in the market. Uh, uh, this is the what are the conditions, what are the uh, the my obligations, so on and so forth. So there is a natural element into going to your CSD. Can can you merge them? Uh, it, it is possible, but. Honestly, it's also the same thing. It's, uh, 
is to allow, if we go for a single CSD, like we have in the, in the, in, in the, in the US, we create a, a, a national monopoly, a European monopoly. Is this what we want? Maybe not. In this moment, uh, we have a big competition among uh, trading venues and CSDs on, on listings. You probably have noticed. All of us are trying to go to talk to the different companies to list in our countries. Is that better or worse than having a single a single CSD? I don't know. I'm, I'm not trying to make a point here of this is the perfect system, but there is a balance here of competition. That's why I said fragmentation, fragmentation, competition. What what do we really want in Europe in this in this? And that what you said, Pauline, on, on on the balance and finally on interoperability and what was mentioned on, on supervision. I have one uh, experience on interoperability, which is the interoperability we hold today in the Swiss uh, clearing. Uh, House, Xclear, with LCH and uh, CBOE. It works. It works very well. But there is, no, there is no common supervision. I'm a Basque, so I'm not a centralist. Sorry, it's impossible that I am a centralist, that I believe that everything has to, work, to be in one place. It's against my DNA. Uh, do we really want to... <laughs> it doesn't mean football team even. Sorry about that. It has a reason. I'll, I'll tell you later. Uh, the thing is that uh, do we really do we really want to have a, a common supervision for everything that is stems from Brussels or from Paris, whatever it is, for everything? Is that what we really want? Is that the best way to bring competition, make an agile market? Is this, is this really what we want? But then let's then let's discuss it because if we try to talk about things in a way that is not disguised, but kind of a, the implicit debate is what do we want? If we want centralized things, uh, as a principle, I am against. As that this is better than, than, than decentralized, I'm against. I have experiences with products that have gone through the, through the uh, centralization of supervision in this moment, which is not really good. It's not agile, it's not time to market. So, I mean, having a single one might, might not be the best solution always. And, and again, I live through a daily experience of not having a single supervisor for an interoperability arrangement, including. By the way, interoperability, again, like fragmentation, is a big word. So we will have to talk about interoperability in access to markets, in trading, in, settle, in clearing. So it's not just one thing. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very broad concept that each one of the pieces have different features that we need to, we not need, need to talk about. Sorry, super long answer. I'm, I'm, I apologize. Um, you know, usually I do agree with 95% what Commissioner McGuinness was saying. But uh, today, and it was a question about this consolidation thing and how we should achieve uh, um, uh, capital market union, she mentioned one sentence, preservation is not a progress. I tend to disagree because answer to your question, I think actually there is a value in local or regional ecosystems which are bringing the SMEs to the market because, um, you know, I, will, I promise to keep it short. I, I have the year to answer just from last week from the regional bank, not a small Czech one, but a regional bank who basically literally wrote me that deals under 200 million are not interesting and that I should go to the small brokers. If we want these small brokers to exist, they have to trade also the blue chips on the market. So if we are if we are in the situation that there will be intense cherry picking due to some regulation and maybe some thoughts let's let's quickly consolidate it we will kill the smaller markets they will never become bigger and the banks from wall street are not flying to the regions they are flying only to the capitals and when the deal is two billion euro plus yeah, uh, just uh, 30 seconds with respect to the csd i think uh, Two proposals I do agree with all the reasons behind this. First, we need to agree on the Prima Rule. We don't have a, a, a private international law rule regarding these things at European level. And second, we could potentially extend the scope of financial collateral directive into other forms, confiscation or covering also retailers, etc., etc., etc. So I think it's very important. Uh, uh, with uh, respect uh, to, uh, I forgot the, what was the third question? The Swedish yeah, yeah. We need to 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 link it to the perspective of uh, what will, are the tax benefits for other countries. For example, in Greece, the for uh, retailers with participation of less than uh, zero point five percent, there is no uh, uh, tax on gains 
from uh, uh, security, listed securities, and the um, um, fee on uh, and the tax on uh, the distributions is only five percent. So this is not, not necessarily translated uh, to. Um, a huge uh, benefit uh, for uh, all uh, um, uh, member states. Maybe if you want, you can uh, read domicile increase. And very briefly, I got a question as well. I think the Commissioner uh, answered to the taxation question. Yes, of course, there could be a role for the EU. Or the recent agreement on the um, withholding tax proposal, of course, shows that EU action in this area is possible. At the same time, of course, there is a, uh, of course, a national uh, role uh, when it comes to the how taxation systems are set up. Uh, I am aware that we run over a lot and I will never ever be allowed to moderate the panel in DCB again. I apologize for that, but I do think that this was really interesting. Please join me in applause for our brilliant panel and then. Um,